just one more thing. If you have a moment, if you have enough time, we might uh, drop a bomb on people and see your thoughts on vitamin D because this is something Ooh. that a lot of people, um, they, uh, they, you know, they ask about, you know, is this something you should uh, supplement if you're not getting enough of it? Um, it is a hormone that has a, you know, a very um, specific and important uh, biological effects in your body. But something that you pointed out was that, um, you know, we'll let you tell it, but that, that this may not be um, as, as straight cut and dry as just more vitamin D good. Uh, yeah. So can we just pause for a second? Yeah. So, so sorry about that. I'm actually at a, uh, a sports medicine conference, our, our uh, annual conference, and uh, I've just ducked out for a session. I just had to answer a query. So, yeah, so the whole thing about vitamin D is this uh, mistake again of correlation and causation. And unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of people have fallen for the mistake of believing that correlation proves causation. Essentially, I believe vitamin D is very important up to a point for certain things, but not as important as a lot of people would make out. It's not a miracle cure for coronavirus, for example. So we know that if you don't have enough, you'll get bone disease, you'll get osteomalacia, you'll have impaired mineralization of bone, you'll get rickets and so on and so forth. And that clearly is going to be a problem. But, you know, if you've got, you know, a modicum of vitamin D levels, that's enough to prevent that. So then the question is, well, we notice that people, when they have high vitamin D levels, they tend to live longer. Therefore, that must prove that vitamin D is good for you, right? Well, not necessarily. So vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. So that means if you're obese, then you've got a larger volume that can absorb vitamin D out of your circulation. So your blood levels of vitamin D will be inversely related to your level of tissue adiposity. And this is true. So we've actually got some studies where we expose people to sunlight or we give them vitamin D supplements. And we find that the level of increment of the vitamin D levels within their serum is impaired if they have excess fat. So basically the fat tissue acts as a sink and draws vitamin D out of the circulation. So therefore, if you lose weight or if you have less body fat, then your vitamin D levels are going to be greater. So vitamin D level can be a surrogate marker for good metabolic health, for, for low fat levels. And this is perfectly consistent with the research and the science we have on coronavirus. We know that um, obese individuals are more likely to suffer complications from coronavirus and that people in good metabolic health who are, who are lean are more likely to survive. So vitamin D, in effect, can just be a surrogate marker for that. So then there's several other questions that arise. So let's talk about uh, sunlight. So everybody says, well, you need to go into the sun to get your vitamin D. Well, is this historically true? We've got, you know, a large proportion of the world with pigmented skin that doesn't generate vitamin D very well. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that people with white skin would have such a, a strong evolutionary advantage from being able to produce vitamin D. That just doesn't make logical sense. Why? And, and indeed, we don't see it. We don't see a massive difference between longevity, between people of different skin pigmentations. So the reason is that historically, if we look at the Inuit population, so they've got pigmented skin and they, uh, they don't really ever see the sun. So when they were first studied, you know, back nearly 100 years ago, they were found to have, uh, actually, I'm not sure exactly when the study was, might have been 90 years ago, um, they were found to have quite adequate vitamin D levels. Why? Where did they get the vitamin D from? So remember, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. Well, it's in the fat of animals that we consume as well. So if you're having a lot of animal produce, then you're consuming vitamin D. It's only in more modern times that we consider you need sun exposure to actually get vitamin D. Because historically, when we weren't afraid of saturated fats in food, we could get all the vitamin D we needed from diet. So that, that's a very natural way. You can get all the vitamin D you need from diet. So then why do we produce it when we go into the sun? And why only pale people? Why not 
dark skin people, why don't they produce much vitamin D? So vitamin D has actually been synthesized as a sunscreen for 500 million years in phytoplankton. So this is something that is absolutely huge. It's just the right size shape and size of a molecule that will absorb the ultraviolet B rays that would normally damage the DNA of our cells. So our bodies actually synthesize vitamin D as a sunscreen. And that's such a bizarre concept, but we're, we've got a lot of proof for that as well. So when you think about it, the body's producing 50,000 units of vitamin D in an afternoon, the sun exposure, that's clearly in excess of what we need to produce for health. It's only producing that much to try and protect you, to try and prevent you from getting sunburn. So vitamin D production in, in response to UVB exposure is nothing more than a protection against sunburn. So Ansel Key's seven countries study, they actually had a subset of the, the study where they actually looked at uh, cholesterol levels in people who are exposed to the sun, and they found that their cholesterol levels were lower. Now, why? Because vitamin D is made from serum cholesterol. So necessarily, people with more cholesterol can make more vitamin D, and therefore, they'll be better protected from the sun. And this is the experience that we see in the ketogenic community. We have a lot of people say, mm. I can go into the sun and I don't burn like I used to. And, you know, we make all these arguments about, you know, H&E and all this kind of stuff in vegetable oils. That's not the case. It's your ability. It's the plant sterols play a role because if you have plant sterols, remember I said that impairs the natural functions, the biochemical functions that cholesterol is needed for, one of which is to synthesize effective vitamin D as a sunscreen. But basically, if you have higher cholesterol levels, you can produce more vitamin D and you'll be better protected against the sun. And by not having fake plant cholesterol in that mix to to muck up your vitamin D synthesis, you'll also, that will lead to a better protection as well. So this very premise that, you know, you need to go into the sun to get your vitamin D, no, you need a healthy diet to get your vitamin D. And this is the whole point that people are taking, you know, buckets of vitamin D supplements saying it's going to make me healthy. No, vitamin D is a surrogate marker for good health. If you have a high vitamin D level that's coming from a healthy lifestyle, that's arising from the fact that you consume a lot of healthy foods rich in vitamin D, then that's associated with good health. If you've got a very high vitamin D level because you, you have a bucket of it every night, well, so what? That doesn't necessarily prove that you've got a healthy lifestyle. There's not necessarily a, a direct correlation between healthy lifestyle and levels of vitamin D in somebody who supplements. So that's why I generally don't, recommend that people supplement as long as they've got a modicum of an acceptable vitamin d level i generally recommend that they don't need to supplement with vitamin d and i'd prefer to see them get uh, adequate vitamin d stores through a healthy lifestyle now there's one other point here uh, and that's about sun exposure so i am absolutely not saying that sunlight is not healthy what I'm saying is that some sunlight is not healthy. So generally, there's three types of UV radiation, and only two of them will penetrate the atmosphere, except on areas where we've got ozone depletion. We don't need to talk about that. But that's UVA and UVB. They're different wavelengths. UVA is quite a long wavelength, and that means it penetrates the atmosphere very nicely. UVB is a little bit shorter, so it doesn't penetrate the atmosphere quite as well. So if we imagine that we've got... The, uh, the surface of the earth, and then you've got a layer of atmosphere on top of the earth. So, well, this is the conference that I'm at, by the way. Um, if the sun's directly overhead, you can see the thickness of atmosphere that it's going to be going through is quite small. So UVB, which actually gets effectively attenuated as it passes through the atmosphere, this is going to be the optimal direction that UVB can get down to cause sunburn. Whereas if the sun's low in the sky and it's coming in on an angle, you can see it could be going through a much longer thickness of atmosphere relatively, and that will actually attenuate out the UVB rays. Now, the UVA is less affected because of the longer wavelength, so that will still get through. So what this means is that when the sun's lower in the sky, you get UVA radiation without getting and much less UVB radiation. In the middle of the day when the sun's overhead, that, that's when you produce vitamin D, um, that's when you get sunburned. Now, the key factor is that 
ultraviolet A radiation produces a very important factor for health. It stimulates something called nitric oxide synthase, which I think in 2006 or thereabouts, probably a different year, it got molecule of the year. Um, pretty important molecule. And that has been associated with improved blood sugar control, improved blood pressure, and basically a bunch of good effects. And in actual fact, this is likely to be a very good reason um, for sun exposure actually being associated with longevity. Not only sun exposure, so here's a crazy study. There's actually studies that demonstrate that sun-induced skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma in a population study in Denmark was associated with an increase in lifespan of about 10 years similar to the, you know, the benefit in terms of people who have been lifelong smokers in reverse. So people with skin cancer on average live longer. This is not to say the skin cancer was good. This was to say there was something else about the lifestyle of these people that may have been good. And I think the most likely explanation for that is the fact that if they, uh, they were exposing themselves to the sun, not only sure they were getting skin cancers, which indicates they were probably getting UVB damage, but they were also getting UVA. And I think there's some inherently good properties from ultraviolet A, given that it, it assists with the synthesis of nitric oxide. So my uh, you know, vitamin D rant is not to say that you shouldn't expose yourself to the sun. It's say that you should expose yourself to the sun in a way that you won't get sunburned. Now in New Zealand, they've got a really nice way of doing this. They just look at the length of your shadow. And as a surrogate marker, if the length of your shadow is shorter than you, then that is suggesting the sun's getting pretty overhead. And the view UV index is, uh, the UVB index is probably going to be, uh, you know, getting up there and you're more likely to burn. And that's a really nice rule of thumb. In Australia, we try and have a rule, say, expose yourself between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Well, that's a nonsense rule because what happens if you live in Hobart or if you live in Brisbane? The different latitudes. What about summer and what about winter different seasons so different the latitude and season will actually impact the height of the sun in the sky at different points of time during the day so it makes far more sense to have an absolute rule that actually more closely reflects the massive atmosphere that the sun rays are passing through and the length of your shadow uh, i think is a, a good marker for that so i think that's enough on that soapbox for the moment <laughs> that's fine. well you know but even to actually add to your point um uh, about vitamin D just you know being uh, protective as a, as a sunblock. I remember reading uh, an article years ago talking about how uh, vitamin D is actually synthesized on the surface of your skin, and therefore, if you want to absorb it, you actually have to uh, let it soak in. It took about six hours to soak in, and so if you went out to the beach, you went out in the sun, you'd have all this vitamin D on your skin, but then people would take a shower to get the sweat off them, and they'd wash <laughs> off all the vitamin D. And so this was saying that you really need to let it soak in. So when you're out at sun exposure, you need to wait for at least six hours to, to absorb all the vitamin D. So that actually fits right in line with your- And they, they sort of missed a trick there. So obviously, if it's being produced on, you know, within the mm. skin like that, it's, it's acting, it, why would it? Why would yeah. the body produce it there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, o on the surface of the skin. And, and, it's and a sunscreen. It's hour, vitamin D is hour. a sunscreen. Yeah. What what is that? Um, I was interested when you said that um, it was it was produced as a um, a sunscreen for like five hundred million years. How, where where did we see that? How do we how do phytoplankton? We see that? Yeah. So within the fossil record. Okay. Right. And so how did they figure out that it was used as a as a sunscreen? I believe. Well, I think it's, I'm not exactly sure of the mechanisms, but they mm. did relate it back to DNA damage and without vitamin D okay. production, apparently their DNA was destroyed. Um, so they couldn't survive. So I, I presume they've probably, um, going back to the fossil record, they've found equivalent phytoplankton today that look identical to that. Mm -hmm. And they've probably done experiments where they've impaired their vitamin D synthesis and seen that they get fried up in the sun. I didn't delve down into the, the molecular genetic, yeah. you know, genetics of what they did, but I imagine that's the only reasonable way you could draw that conclusion. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's super interesting anyway. And it's, um, you know, something that I've had to reconsider now too, since, since seeing your, uh, your your soapbox box rant at the at the co at the conference that made me sort of think about like hmm all right you know maybe we should think about this um well that's cool it's really interesting well hey paul thank you so much uh, i think we've been talking for almost uh three hours now so, so i'll let you go back to your your conference